Hey everybody, this is Fred Ricciani of TSC. I have right here via Skype our good friend Paul DeMar Lazenby, actor, stuntman, one of the hosts of the Killing the Town podcast, Mo Capper. This guy's got more titles than Hiroshi Tanahashi. We're here to talk about his recent trip in Japan, checking out the Tokyo Dome, Wrestle Kingdom, front and center, and much more. Paul, how's it going? Really good. I actually got to correct you on one thing. I'm no longer a regular host of the Killing the Town podcast. I, it was just, it became too tough to make it work with my regular schedule. So Don Callis is carrying that show and I just guest on it once in a while. So you give him the rub once in a blue moon. Exactly. Yeah. You know, go in for a ratings pop and then take off again for a little while. I help the kid out. Yeah. Help that uh, young upstart uh, <laughs> Cyrus. Yeah. He's struggling in the business right now, man. You know, he, he needs to, you need to leg up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, you just came back from a, a trip to Japan. It, it's funny. Last year, I, I think, was your first time back in 20 years since, since you fought. I did before last, so this would be my third trip back. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your third your third trip back. And it, it, it's just funny, right? Like, you haven't been there in so long. Now it seems like you're making it a yearly thing. How's your trip to the Rise of the Sun? Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, I was saying before, it's it, it's getting to the point where it's going to be a shock to my system when I don't fly to J Japan on New Year's Day because it's uh, I've been doing it so often now. But I love it. I love Japan. You know, it's just it's such a great country. And, and uh, so I'm always happy to be back. Do you have any pro tips for somebody like me that wants to go but speaks no Japanese and has no friends in Japan whatsoever? Yeah, it's actually surprisingly easy. Um, people are very accommodating over there. You know, the politeness is kind of ingrained in the culture. And a lot of people speak at least a little bit of English. Uh, it's, it's a lot easier now than it was when I first was over there in the 90s fighting because now you have translation software that you can use as well. Uh, but uh, I would say just have some sort of English to Japanese translation um, uh, technology or a, or a book or whatever. And people love you for making any effort whatsoever. I think uh, I think they might be used to Westerners going over there and just expecting everybody to speak English. So when a Westerner actually makes the effort to you know use one or two words of Japanese, uh, they really appreciate that. But generally, you won't have a problem getting by. For those that don't know, you started out in the business with the likes of Chris Jericho. You were technically the first graduate of the Storm Wrestling Academy with Lance Storm way back in the day. You started out with Don Cyrus Callis, who's the lead commentator of New Japan. It's got to be crazy for you, right, to be in Japan, to be at the Tokyo Dome, New Japan's version of WrestleMania, the Super Bowl, and to see some of your closest friends like all up in the mix at this stage of their careers, right? Yeah, it, uh, I remember last year, uh, which was the year that uh, Jericho fought Kenny Omega, and uh, we went into the dome, we showed up and, and we're, we're sitting in Chris's dressing room. And I just looked at him and said, dude, how insane is this? Like, you helped to teach me how to wrestle in a bowling alley in Calgary in 1991. And now we're sitting here in a locker room in the freaking Tokyo Dome. And even Chris, like a guy who's had so much success for so long, he was saying the same thing. So he just it kind of blows him away to look back at where he started and where he's ended up now. So it was it was extremely cool. And uh, this year, more than any other, because. Not only was Chris there, but I've made friends with a lot of other people on the, the New Japan roster. So it was uh, it was going back to see them as well, getting to hang out with them in Rapongi and and uh, like a really good bunch of guys. I've never been to the Tokyo Dome, but I've been to say like Madison Square Garden a number of times, and I've been to Barclays, a few other arenas in this area. And when you step into the mecca like Madison Square Garden, like you feel something special. There's just a vibe, and I would imagine that's the case with the legendary Tokyo Dome, whether it be for baseball, football, and, of, of course, uh, MMA and, and professional wrestling. Uh, can you describe the feeling of being at the Tokyo Dome and just kind of how, do, how does it feel to be there front and center compared to other arenas? It's really cool. I mean, in my case, two of the last three years, I've, I've been lucky enough to have a backstage pass, so I got to experience it from from the backstage angle and from from the watching the show. But uh, you, you feel the history. You know, if you go into any building like that, you feel the history that the legendary things have happened there. And I just I kept thinking of all the the legendary names in pro wrestling that have uh, walked that same ground in the Tokyo Dome. And likewise for uh, Corken uh, Hall, which is right beside the Tokyo Dome, uh, even more so. That's kind of a crappy little building that seats about 2000, but maybe the most historic uh, combat sports building in Japan. It, it's older. I believe it's older than the Tokyo Dome. But uh, that's where I had my last fight with Pancras, and uh, it, that has also seen all kinds of history. Even though it's a small venue, anybody who's anybody runs it. So uh, it's really cool that not only do they have this big Tokyo Dome event every January 4th, but every January 5th, New Japan also runs New Year Dash at Cork and Hall. So you get to feel the history in both places. I thought Wrestle Kingdom was 
top to bottom, absolutely fantastic. And it's definitely in the running already for show of the year like it has been for the last few years. What you think about it live, man? I was watching Tanahashi Omega. My jaw was dropping. O Okada White, I thought, was a, a fantastic matchup as well. And believe it or not, I, I think Jericho versus Naito, even at Jericho's age in his late 40s, I think that might have been his best match. Uh, Jericho just keeps going from strength to strength. But it's uh, I, I was... I was talking with Suzuki about it too. I went to see Minoru Suzuki at his uh, his pile driver store in Harajuku, and uh, we were talking about you know we're both the same age. We're ten days apart in age, and I was saying, "How are you doing? How's your body doing?" And he said, "Fine, it's, it's good." He said, "I just I'm always training." And same with Chris. You know, despite his road schedule, he's always training. So I think it, it's a combination of things because I'm lucky enough to have the same thing going on. Uh, I think you have to combine uh, to an extent when you're pushing yourself as hard as like Suzuki or Jericho or myself, you've got to combine a, a genetic uh, predisposition to absorbing punishment and doing it well. Uh, you have to have a good work ethic and stay on top of your training. But if you do that, then, you know, 48, 49, 50 years old, that number doesn't mean what it used to. And, uh, you know, you look at a guy like Michael O'Hearn, he's 49 years old and one of the best looking people on the planet. He's got a face and a body that most 20 year olds would kill for. Uh, and, still, and can perform, you know, he's, he's just not just a bodybuilder, he's an athlete. So uh, I, I think he's just staying on top of it. And, uh, you know, Jericho's done it. I've done it. Suzuki's done it. And that's why we can still do fun stuff at uh, 48, 49, 50 years old. Do you think a guy like Chris Jericho for the impact that he's had on New Japan these last couple of years, do you think he's he's made a case for wrestlers to have an off season or at least some type of extended time off? Because it's definitely done wonders for him and the New Japan product. Uh, he's made a case for it, but it's not going to happen. I, I can't see the paradigm changing anytime soon because, you know, WWE Vince calls the shots. Now, if something like AEW becomes a big thing or Impact is continuing to grow as well, and if uh, someone becomes a, a solid second contender and starts cycling performers, then I think if they find a way to do that, that makes good business sense, then I think it's going to make them very attractive because – uh, in Japan, they you know they always used to do that. I remember hearing stories about you know why am I not seeing Terry Gordy and Steve Williams around in North America much? Well, it's because they like their deal in all Japan. They do ten week tours and then they come home and they have a lot of time off. They're not on the road twenty four seven three sixty five. So uh, I I think it's a very good idea, uh, but I can't see it changing in WWE. You've been to the last couple of Tokyo Dome shows, Wrestle Kingdom. Was there anything that jumped out at you from two thousand seventeen to two? Well, I guess like two thousand eighteen to two thousand nineteen. Um, to be honest, I thought that, and this is, you know, I, I thought this year's show was fantastic. I thought if you look at it top to bottom, I thought that last year's show might've been a little bit stronger across the board, but, uh, nothing bad to be said for the last three or four matches, especially in, uh, in this year's wrestle kingdom. And I really enjoyed Jericho Naito, not just because Chris has been a friend of mine for almost 30 years, but because I, I like the, the scrappier, more brawl style fights. And so that's the really cool thing about this show is it gave you so many different flavors of, of you know, whatever you were looking for. If you like high spots, it gave you that. If you like a good street fight, you know, that was Jericho Naito. And, uh, you know, if you check out my or Chris Jericho's Instagram page, then you'll find a lot of pictures of Jericho's legitimate battle scars. You know, he came out of that beat up as hell and so did Naito, but they were both smiling. Uh, and then you, you had, you know, solid, solid, classic level main event wrestling with uh, Kenny Omega versus Tanahashi. So there was something for everybody. What, what's your assessment of Jay White from year one to switch, Switchblade to year two? I think he's he's definitely developing. I mean, he's a guy that uh, I think would have benefited from being brought along more slowly uh, because all the pieces are there, but you can tell he's still developing. He's still better than most of the, the performers in the world, and uh, he's way better than I ever was. Uh, but as far as being pushed as hard as he is, uh, I think he's dealing extremely well with uh, being pushed that fast. You know, he just found himself in a position where you know, I got the impression that he was maybe supposed to stay in Ring of Honor a little bit longer. But New Japan needed a guy and like, no, we're bringing you in and we're, we're strapping a rocket to you. And he's fielding it very well. So um, I think that there are still a few wrinkles to be ironed out as far as establishing him as a top, top, top guy. But I don't think they're going to take long to rank them to iron out. He's, he's made great progress in the last year. Uh, he's really establishing himself, and especially with the new departures from New Japan, creating a vacuum that's going to draw guys like him upward. Uh, I think he's going to be very capably carry the New Japan standard in the, in the near future. Now, I know Kenny Omega's future at the time we're recording this is up in the air. A lot of people, myself included, think he's going to go to AEW. Some may say he'll 
go to WWE. But if you look at that date, January 4th, and you look at the top four guys in New Japan Pro Wrestling, Naito, Omega, Okada, Tanahashi. Can you think of a time where there have been four better top guys for a promotion? Not better. I mean, there have been eras where you had like Kawada, Masawa, Kabashi, uh, and, you know, you could put Gordy or Hanson or anybody in that fourth spot. Uh, you know, you had the three Musketeers and, and uh, a lot of other stellar talent during previous eras of New Japan. So uh, I, I wouldn't say better. No, they're, they're as good as any uh, four superstar lineup that any promotion has ever had. They're fantastic. Now, to what you mentioned before with the mass exodus of stars, the, the elite going, of course, to All Elite Wrestling, Kenny Omega may just go straight to AW. Let's just say they don't do a deal with New Japan. Kushida rumored to be going to WWE. Do you think within a year's time to the next Tokyo Dome show, New Japan can bring up a guy like Jay White or Juice Robinson to replace those guys or at least fill in the void? Oh, absolutely. And, and I think uh, I think the timing is very good for those guys. Uh, I think, like I said, Jay's developing quickly, and I think he's going to continue to do so. And by this time next year, uh, he will be a vastly improved player, and he's already great. Uh, Juice is a guy that you know we've been watching come along over the last few years. I I had been hearing his name a lot before I came out here two years ago, or came out to Japan two years ago, and uh, I saw him for the first time when he wrestled Cody in the in the Tokyo Dome, and I was just blown away. You know, the guy is, he knows the value of selling, which a lot of people don't these days. And he's just such a good all-around guy. And he's got a great personality and loads of charisma. And he's just kind of been been rising, steadily rising over the last two years. And he's ready to step up and, and take his spot as a, as a true top, top guy in the company. And uh, I heard that he just signed a new multi-year deal with New Japan. So uh, I think it's a smart move for him. I, I, I got the impression from what I was hearing, you know, here and there that, you know, WWE might be interested in taking, bringing them back, and uh, AEW had some interest. Uh, but if those things are true, uh, I think that he made the right decision by staying with New Japan because that power vacuum is being created by the departing superstars, and, and Juice has been building momentum all this time, and it's, it's just perfect timing for him to step up and, and take one of those spots. Right, and who would have thought just a few years ago, right, he was C.J. Parker, this environmentalist guy in, in NXT, the the, the only time he really shined, I think, was in, in Kevin Owens' debut match in NXT where we got to see what he could really do. Uh, other than that, he, he was kind of a nothing guy. Goes to New Japan, you know, goes into deep end, pays his dues, and definitely definitely a rising star. Yeah, and, and, it, and went through the dojo system, too. You know, I think that's why he gets a lot of respect over there is because he didn't want to just come over as a, as a, a foreigner that got put straight in the ring. He said, I want, I want to live in the dojo. You know, I want to do it like that, so... I think that's where uh, he gets a lot of respect from the Japanese uh, wrestling community because he did it as if you were one of them. He didn't ask for any special treatment. I was listening to an old clip where you challenged Taz to a fight on YouTube on the Killing the Town podcast. The the background was Taz, of course, was kind of in- intimating that Shane McMahon could possibly beat some MMA fighters. And you mentioned your dojo experience and how you were personally stretched and tortured by your now good friend, Minoru Suzuki. For any wrestling fans watching, listening to this, that aren't too sure what the dojo system is like, can you describe a day in the life of being in a dojo with a great Minoru Suzuki? Well, it, I have to preface this by saying that I actually did receive privileged treatment when I went to the Packers Dojo. Uh, I actually felt guilty about it because um, uh, if you haven't heard the story before, I, I lied my way into that company. I had no experience in any combative sport whatsoever. No wrestling, no boxing, no kickboxing, martial arts, nothing. So I lied and, and said that I did and, and ended up learning by fighting in Pancrase. Uh, after they saw some potential in me and they thought, OK, well, let's, let's bring him into the dojo if he wants to come. But I wasn't doing all the young boy stuff like cooking and cleaning and, and taking care of the, the senior fighters. And in fact, they were doing that for me. And that, that's why I felt very guilty about it, because they had all paid more dues than I had. So uh, I had a bit of an easier dojo experience than, say, someone like my buddy Stuart Fulton, who does uh, who does English language commentary for Pancrase. And uh, he was Sakuraba's uh, torture dummy and also had to live the young boy life. He's from Scotland, but he was a Scottish young boy and he, he was doing all that stuff. Uh, but that being said, it was still really grueling. I mean, it was I expected the Pancras dojo to be state of the art and it was actually very, uh, very rough, very primitive. Uh, kind of a corrugated metal shack out in the, the suburbs of Yokohama. 
Uh, no indoor heat, no indoor plumbing. I, they did have an indoor shower, but no indoor toilet. You had to go halfway down a hill to uh, to use an outhouse. And uh, sleeping on a mat on the floor. And then, yeah, the infamous day that uh, I guess Suzuki decided to see if the investment they were making in me was worth it. And stretched me so horribly for 30 straight minutes that I remember it vividly over 20 years later. Uh, the He... He's so good. He can put you in agony without actually injuring you so you can't train anymore. And, uh, yeah, he, he definitely did that to me for 30 straight minutes. So it's, it's something I won't forget anytime soon. Do you think elements of the Japanese dojos could work in the U.S. and in North America? I don't know because I'm not sure how many people would submit to those conditions. I mean, we, we really do live in an overprivileged society right now. And a lot of the time people think if something's too difficult or – the first time I hit a little speed bump or the first time somebody says something negative to me, well, then I'm just going to leave. And, you know, I, I, I should never feel uncomfortable. But uh, at the same time, I think there are young male and female fighters and wrestlers out there that might submit to that. I don't know that it would work on the same level as in Japan. But if you could run people through a system like that, uh, I think you would end up with better performers and, and or fighters at the end of the day. All elite wrestling. Things are ridiculously fluid right now at the time we're recording this they just had their press conference their rally where they revealed a number of wrestlers have signed of course the obvious is the elite some surprises such as chris jericho and Pac, aka former WWE superstar neville there are various reports from the wrestling observer that they have potential tv deals on the table for a prime time two hour show a lot to take in paul what are your thoughts right now based on what we know about aew well, it's it, they're certainly ambitious, uh, and I think that Jericho's acquisition is going to give them a lot of momentum that they very badly need right now. You know, the, the, obviously the Bucks being on board, Cody being on board, they have, <clears throat> they have a lot of buzz. But you know, Chris, he's got another level of visibility, another, another level of star power. So signing on with AEW is making a very big statement that they want to they want to be known as players in North America. Um, really. You you don't know until they come out of the gate and see what they've got. You know they, they've got all the pieces in place, but you've got a guy running the company or financing the company. Is it Tony Khan? Tony um, Khan, the son of Shad yeah. Khan, Jaguar's owner. Yep. And it's my understanding he doesn't have a great deal of experience in the wrestling business. Uh, and at the same time, uh, it can be a difficult balancing act being pushed talent and in the office at the same time. Uh, so that's something that we'll see how well Cody and the Bucks and, and whoever else is on the booking team can navigate. Um, I'm not saying they can't, but I'm just saying it, it adds another another level of difficulty to running the company. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, that's that's what makes AEW so compelling is that they've they've come out so big and so brash and with they've made so many bold moves. Now let's see what they're going to do with it. Do you think at some point New Japan Pro Wrestling will either establish a women's division or work with a company like Stardom to have some type of women's division? I would like to see it because, you know, Japanese pro wrestling, the heyday of Japanese pro wrestling, which I think is around the 90s, um, is some of the best wrestling you're ever going to see. You know, look at Manami Toyota's matches, and, and she's as good a worker, male or female, as you're ever going to see. So uh, the I, I would like to see that because um, I, I think the women need to be showcased more, and especially the way they wrestle in Japan. Um, it's It's a tougher style it's a stiffer style but uh as you see in any woman who establishes uh, establishes herself in japan and then comes back home to north america like medusa like uh, awesome kong you know they 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 come back a level above everybody else just automatically by virtue of having worked in japan so i, I would love to see i think there would be a tremendous benefit to uh to women's wrestling worldwide if there were more opportunities on a big stage in Japan for women. And so it made more women want to go and train in that style. Oh, I totally agree. And I think too, for the Western audience, let's just say that New Japan isn't able to work anything out with AEW. They lose the elite and they're trying to still expand and out West and North America. It wouldn't make sense to have a women's division. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, WWE has made the women's movement a buzzword. Um, it, it, it's, it's kind of funny to me that they've done a lot for women's wrestling and increasing its exposure. But I also there's a lot about the WWE women's matches that um, I think could be improved upon. And I'm not saying all of them. I'm saying there's some blow away great matches and some incredibly talented uh, wrestlers in that company. But just uh, there, there has also been some stuff that looked kind of like going through the motions by certain performers to me. Uh, it looks to me like because the women's movement is very popular 
everybody kind of got swept along with that wave and not everybody deserves to be pushed to, to the same extent. Um, you've got, you know, obvious all-stars like Becky Lynch, like Charlotte, like Asuka and so on. Uh, but at the same time, I think that uh, the way it's done in Japan, uh, I think would be uh, a lot better. I think that running a, a women's company, the way Japanese wrestling is structured, uh, would make it a little bit more uh, merit-based. Uh, I think that it's only partially merit-based in WWE, and in some cases, people are pushed beyond what they deserve to be pushed as. I'm not including Ronda Rousey in that, because for a first timer, she's done incredibly well, and obviously is famous enough and, and draws enough to justify her spot. But overall, I prefer the Japanese system, so I'd like to see more of that. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, in, in some ways, maybe WWE did a favor for New Japan if and when they establish a women's division, because you look at Yo Shirai, she's getting over in NXT right now. Kairi Sane's, uh, you know, gotten over. Uh, you know, Dakota Kai ha had a run in, in, in stardom before. Tony Storm. So, you know, there has been already a, a precedent for women that have gotten over in stardom and other Japanese promotions to come to the U.S. or return to the U.S. and become bigger stars. Yeah, uh, and and likewise, you know, uh, the, the Japanese... Uh, talent coming here and then returning home, if they do, uh, they're going to have that additional cachet. If I, I was in WWE, if Shinsuke Nakamura comes back to New Japan, he's going to be bigger than ever. And he was huge when he left. So uh, it, it never hurts to go somewhere else and try another style. I think the, the Japanese system of sending your young talent out on excursions to different countries to learn different styles is such a great idea. And, and I think that that's a problem with the, the performance center, WWE performance center, is that they're all learning the same things. Uh, promo wise, uh, match wise. So everybody comes out talking the same, moving the same, doing the same things. And uh, you can, you can tell when you watch NXT, you can see who the cookie cutters are and who the ones are that have learned multiple things out on the Indies and then brought that to the PC and already have it as a part of their style. I'm not saying you can't grow out of the PC into something like somebody like Velveteen Dream seems to be doing really well. And it's my understanding he, he started at the PC, but for the most part, I think it's a flawed system because I think you need to expose yourself to a bunch of different styles to find the one that works for you. So, so do you think whether it's fair or unfair, the talent's got to find a way to do something different and not get stuck with, I hate to say the word complacent, but you know, creatively complacent. You mentioned Velveteen Dream. I think another team, and granted, I know they worked indies before, but the Revival. The Revival are different from everybody on the roster. And yeah, they're kind of a throwback, but they certainly stand out now. Yeah, and that's just it. Sometimes what's old is new again. And the revival bring into modern wrestling a lot of things that work. You know, I, I don't ever want to be mistaken for an old guy who says it should be like it was back in the old days because there are things in wrestling today that are better than they ever were. The athleticism, for one, is at a higher level than ever before. And, and, and the, the money-making opportunities for wrestlers have never been better. But at the same time, just because you move into a new era, it doesn't mean you discard everything from the previous era. You have to keep the stuff that's working. Uh, an example I always bring up is uh, PWG show, the only one I ever went to. Uh, Kyle O'Reilly was uh, defending his world title against Chris Hero. And I, uh, I sat through every high spot in the world before we even got to the intermission. And PWG shows are filled with people who want to see high spots. They love that stuff. But even that crowd was starting to turn on the talent because – when your curtain jerker match goes 15 minutes with 15, you love five topes and, and every flip in the world. And then you've got five, six, seven more matches. And then you hit the intermission. Well, we've already seen everything. We're all numb to it all. And if it's just high spots, then um, it, it's, it's going to burn your crowd out, even if your crowd's there to see high spots. So we got to the semi-main event, uh, Hero versus O'Reilly. And uh, it was 20 minutes to midnight, going into our sixth hour of the show in a hot, unventilated building. Hero and O'Reilly just wrestled. They were the only ones on the show to just wrestle. No flips, no anything. They told a story. There were times they were on the same spot on the canvas for five, six minutes. Uh, they went over 40 minutes, and they actually rejuvenated the crowd for the main event because it was something different. And, and it made me realize then that uh, the business will never evolve beyond storytelling and psychology. And, and that's why I think that new talent definitely do the things in new wrestling that are working. But you need to learn the foundation skills from previous generation and then build your athleticism, your high spots and whatever else on top of that. Otherwise, you're going to be an incomplete worker and you're going to have a limited appeal for the most part. Well said. I, dude, I actually have a similar story. I went to a TNA New York taping. I think it was their last year of Spike. And they had two matches set. They had a tag title match, which was a TLC match. And then they had a world title match later on the show with Lashley versus Bobby Roode. 
And in that TLC match, it was the, the Dudleys, it was the Hardys, it was the American Wolves, and they did every high spot imaginable, tables, matches, ladder bumps. And it was just absolutely insane. And I was thinking the same thing. You were like, oh, God, like how is this crowd going to get up for this world title match with Bobby Lashley and, and Bobby Roode, two Matt-based guys? And I, I kid you not, less than an hour after a TLC match, they had that New York crowd, that tough New York crowd, in the palm of their hand. So it, it, to your point, I mean, you saw it live, I've seen it live, and then well, let's bring up an example that probably a lot of people have seen watching and listen to this. Chris Jericho, the, la the last couple of years, his matches uh, at the Tokyo Dome shows were completely different from all these other matches. And it's not exactly easy to follow guys like the Bucks, Will Ospreay, Okada, but he managed to pull it off and prove that point. Yeah, and, and you follow them by being different. You know, you're not going to do what the Bucks do and Will Ospreay do uh, better than them or even as good as them. They're, they're incredibly good at that. And, and there's, there's definitely a place for that. I mean, you look at the success of all those guys, especially the Bucks. And, and I used to be a purist who thought the Bucks were just spot monkeys and I didn't like them and they're killing the business. And then I realized, hang on a second, these guys are self-made millionaires. They're obviously tapping into something the fans want. So they deserve to be on the show. And I've since found out they can actually work really well too. If you take their, their high spots away, they can actually work. They're, they're really good. But um, you need to have diversity on your on your uh, show, and that means different styles. I had this conversation with Juice Robinson and Rocky Romero my last night in Japan, and we we were all agreeing that too many high spots or just a, a card full of high spot matches is bad. But you need that represented, even if that's not the style that that you like. It's a style that a lot of other people like, and you need it on your show. And then you need straight wrestling on your show and maybe a comedy match on your show and you know give the people a mixed bag so they're just not just watching the same thing over and over before i let you go i have to ask you about ring of honor because it's kind of awkward for them right now they they gave a great platform to cody rhodes uh, the young bucks the elite to do their thing you know filming you know what during roh tapings helped promote all in helped produce all in helped distribute all in and now just a couple months later they created their biggest competitor. So I feel like this year is kind of a make or break for Ring of Honor. It could be a case where Sinclair says, hey, guys, you know, we built a great library. We have these talent contracts. Maybe we'll sell to WWE. Or it could be a case where it lights a fire under their ass and they finally put that full corporate backing uh, behind ROH. In 2019, which way do you see ROH going? I think they're primed to make a move. Uh, I, I see it in uh, – I see these little indications like uh, – well, for instance, here in Vancouver, uh, last night and tonight, they've got a two-day event called uh, Ballroom Brawl run by ECCW. And uh, I heard they were supposed to have PCO and Bandito on the show, and then both of those guys got pulled. And uh, I know in at least PCO's case, it's, it was because of ROH. And they just said, that's it. We're locking you down. You, you've, we've got a contract with you. We do work with other companies, but we're starting to pull our talent in. And I think you might see ROH getting more stingy with the talent and locking them down to longer deals uh, in, in, so they can be braced against, uh, further, uh, departures and further talent raids and things like that. They, I know that they don't want to be a WWE feeder system. Uh, they don't want to build people up only to have them run away to AEW. So I, I think you're going to see them get more aggressive in locking their talent down and establishing themselves uh, more solidly in 2019. And Hey, who does that benefit? It benefits the fans watching and it definitely benefits the wrestlers for finally being able to drive up the bargain and get more money. Yeah, it's it's really nice. I mean, it reminds me of the glory days of MMA when you had Pride and UFC bidding against one another. It was great for the fighters. Uh, and the same thing when you had Japan and WCW and WWE all running strong. You always had someone to play against someone else. And, it, you know, a monopoly benefits very few people. So it's really cool to see these other options popping up and viable options and viable alternatives to being in WWE to the point that now you see people getting WWE offers and sometimes saying, no, thank you. I, I prefer it on the indies. So, uh, yeah, never been a better time to be uh, an in-demand pro wrestler. Oh, yeah, definitely. 2019 is certainly going to be fun. I know you got a lot going on. What can you tell us is in store for you? Um, well, I just wrapped uh, shooting on Gears Five, uh, Gears of War Five. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, that's going to be the end of my four-year run playing Marcus Phoenix. Uh, I was in the previous uh, Marcus Phoenix in Gears of War Ultimate and Gears of War Four. Uh, so uh, bringing that to a close, but that was, you know, it, it's it's been a real privilege to play such an iconic character for four years. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I I very much enjoyed it while it lasted, uh, but uh, it's it's finally decided it was time to move on to something else. Um, 
Uh, I've been working on a lot of CW shows, you know, Riverdale, Legends of Tomorrow, Arrow. Uh, in fact, I was just uh, I was in a scene with Cody on Arrow just a few weeks ago. Uh, he's uh, I'm not sure if, what's going on with this character right now, but I don't want to spoil anything. <laughs> um, yeah, and then I'm working on uh, the third volume of my book series, When We Were Bouncers Three. So I'm already starting to collect uh, a, a few interviews for that. That should be coming out later this year or early next year. And um, yeah, even though I'm not a co-host, definitely listen to the Killing the Town podcast with Don Callis, and you'll hear me and sometimes Lance Storm will guest on it as well. And he, he's still doing a great job of carrying the standard for that. And just real quickly, too, you mentioned when we were bouncers. For those that don't know about it, can you just give us like a little brief synopsis of what's behind the series? Yeah, it's it's a collection of um, interviews with famous pro wrestlers and, and MMA fighters, other combative athletes, uh, actors, comedians, stuntmen, uh, just a wide variety of uh, famous and accomplished people telling stories of their days working as bouncers as they were working their way up the ladder of success. So it's, uh, I bounced for over uh, about 20 years. And so I thought when I started writing this series that there's going to be no surprises for me. I've seen it all. Uh, I was very wrong. <laughs> there's some insane stories in there. So uh, definitely check it out. There's two volumes on sale at whenwewerebouncers.com or you can find it on Amazon or just ask your local bookseller and they can ship it in for you. When We Were Bouncers 1 and 2. And there's some extreme stuff in there. For sure. Thanks so much, Paul. Appreciate it, man. Thank you.